Okay, good evening, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome back. My name is Dr. Sean from Vitality Chiropractic and this is our interview series where I'll be talking with other healthcare professionals and chiropractors, talking about how they got started, their stories, and of course the people that they help. Today's guest is Dr. Rob Sinnott from America. Dr. Rob completed his Doctor of Chiropractic with a research honors from Palmer College of Chiropractic. Then in 2000, he completed his Legion of Chiropractic Philosopher. And then in 2005, he completed his Diploma in Philosophical Standards at the ICPA and Palmer Institute for Professional Advancement. In 2010, he was inducted as a Fellow of Philosophy of Chiropractic at the Council, of, sorry, the Council on Chiropractic Philosophy of the ICA, and he is the author of two chiropractic books as well. How are things going at the moment in the States? Uh, you know, they're going pretty well from a chiropractic perspective. I, uh, I don't find the frustrations that a lot of people seem to find, but you know, I view things a little bit differently. I put everything through my chiropractic, uh, you know, my chiropractic, um, I, I tint everything through that chiropractic lens. Uh, you know, when I see uh, something like we have going on in this worldwide issue right now with this uh, COVID-19, you know, I, I, I may not like the way things are done in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction or this country or whatever it might be. It's very frustrating. Um, you know, but at the same time, if we have been teaching our patients and the people in our community, if our message has been about how the body adapts, determines whether or not, uh, you know, you're fertile for a microbe to, to take root. Uh, you know, if you go back to uh, Claude Bernard, who was a, uh, a noted uh, physician and educator, uh, medical doctor in France, at the medical school in Paris, uh, you know, he had a student everyone knows named Louis Pasteur, and Louis Pasteur had a had a view that um, <clears throat> of the germ theory that germs make you sick. And Claude Bernard disagreed with him, you know, years after he was a student, of course. But uh, Claude Bernard disagreed with his student and and said that, you know, the, the seeds of disease hover hover around us, and it's not until the soil is ready or or fertile for that to take place or to take root that um, <clears throat> the germ theory even makes any sense. And uh, of course we know over time that Dr. Bernard was right and past year was a little bit off. Uh, you know, I mean, he had some points to that, that bear fruit in that discussion, but he totally took out the, the uh, personal ability to, to adapt or to a stressor and a, you know, a, a microbe or a germ or a virus, whatever is a stressor. Uh, it's a type of stressor. If you think of during um, in the 1940s here in America, during the polio uh, epidemic, uh, we had a lot of uh, young children that would be quarantined to their home. And we think we're on quarantine now, but quarantine mean you, means you can't go to the store and get groceries. You can't leave your house. That's quarantine. This is, this is more of a, a uh, I don't know what they call it, but there's different terms for it, I suppose. But that was an actual quarantine where you had to stay in your home, according to the jurisdiction you were at in the United States, you had to stay in your house. Um, of course, a lot of these children had, you know, paralyzed legs or whatever it might be along with this because it was part of the polio picture. But when they would quarantine me into my house, let's say, uh, my brothers and sisters and my parents, they didn't, they didn't contract polio, but they were breathing more polio than the average person that, that was in a house without someone that was quarantined. So why didn't everyone in my house get quarantined? According to Louis Pasteur, if the germs cause disease, my family is breathing my exhaust. I mean, there's so much polio that they should have, they should have uh, easily caught this virus, but it very rarely happened that anyone else in the home uh, contracted polio from someone who was quarantined. So really it, it, po it points to Bernard's view, Claude Bernard's view, that the soil has to be uh, you know, the ground has to be accepting of that seed. Uh, you know, if it's not fertile, if it's not the right place for that seed to take root, it can't. So, you know, our bodies have the ability to fend off and recognize things. Now, we didn't do antibody tests in the 1940s for polio that I'm aware of, but had that been capable, we would have uh, probably, and I, I don't know this, but I would assume from a philosophical perspective, it makes sense, that we would have seen that, you know, if we were in the same home, and I, I, had, I was quarantined with polio that you might have been tested and they would have found that you already had the, the polio antibody because your body recognized this, this pathogen and made an antibody to it and you never got a symptom. So, you know, 
it makes you know scientific sense as far as a you know in a deductive way of of how that fits. Um, I'm not saying that COVID is like that. We don't know. Everything is different. Um, but the body's resistance, you know, there, there's plenty of research out there, more modern research from the, you know, the past few years that discusses that the, um, that the resistance of the body is more important than the virulence of the pathogen, uh, because not everyone contracts anything, you know, there were, there was a, uh, uh, in the 1950s, there was a leper research clinic, a chiropractic leper research clinic in Africa and it just took care of people with uh, what was then known as leprosy. And uh, they had tremendous changes in these people because, you know, why would, why would one person in a family go through something so tragic and, and everyone else escape? And, you know, it leads back to Dee Dee's initial question, you know, why have two men working in the same shop at the same bench, breathing the same air, you know, why is one sick and one isn't? What's the difference? And that's really where our philosophy started. And considering that's the beginning of our chiropractic view of health versus the medical view of disease, you know, this should be an opportune time to have those discussions in our practices and in our communities. And uh, I, you know, it's a little frustrating because I wish more people were having those discussions because we have, you know, there, there are millions and millions of, of opportunities on the internet to, to, to make these points, even if we're sheltered in place or whatever it might be. And if we're in practice, it brings up an opportunity to talk to people about, uh, you know, about how the immune system functions. You know, the chiropractic connection to a lot of these things, um, you know, it's, it's a little frustrating that our researchers have completely ignored their responsibility and they haven't even tried to uh, find answers to the immune uh, connection to chiropractic. But if you've been in practice for any number of years at all, you have people coming to you because they will tell you, I have seen such changes and I never get sick anymore. I don't have this problem. I don't have that problem. I used to get a flu every year. I, you know, I used to have pneumonia every few years and I haven't had a problem. I'm not saying chiropractic did that because chiropractic didn't do that because, you know, you can, you know, a corpse has the same parts as a living person as far as what we look at scientifically. But the main difference is that, is that um, there's something in a living thing that co controls and coordinates all the activities. That's what's missing. And that is what heals people. That is what determines whether or not we'll be sick. Well, that, and as Reggie Gold used to say, you pick your grandparents very carefully, you know, because genes do play a role. Um, you know, there are genetic um, disorders and things like that that are passed passed down, but you know, uh, in some instances. But uh, you know, this is a little bit different today, and we have so little science. They have two or three months of science uh, to look at. So even the scientists that are studying COVID, they don't know much about it at this point. So you know, that doesn't even have to be part of our discussion uh, in the office or in our in our you know our practice or in our community. But just talking about how the immune system functions. We don't even have to get into the chiropractic end of it. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at what's called the innate immune system and you, and you look at the, the, uh, you know, the adaptive immune system uh, and these, these, how they function, it's so chiropractically congruent with, with the way we think for us to discuss with people. And, uh, you know, people do find it quite interesting. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a trying time for our profession to get on message and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people doing a good job with it out there, but it's a little frustrating that some people just are, are adamantly opposed to talking about chiropractic uh, uh, in this in this most opportune time. It's really, I agree. It's, a, it's an opportunity to then try to shift this paradigm because, I mean, I see this here, but I know it's the same everywhere. There is always this focus of things like back pain, things like, again, symptomology, rather than actually focusing on the function of the body. For patients who have never seen a chiropractor before, how would you then describe chiropractic to them? Because I'm sure a lot of people are going to be thinking of that, that palliative side of care. Yes. And well, you know, pain is part of the human experience. I, you know, Dr. Crowder, who I mentioned before, uh, you know, in a, in a discussion he had uh, one day in a, in a small group, he said that, uh, uh, he was talking about a little girl that got her vision back after she was adjusted and just relating her, her, her circumstances. And, um, 
I said to him, I said, well, that's, that's really, that's really, um, that's really interesting. You know, I said, that's, that's amazing. And he said, no, it's not. I said, what do you mean? It's, it seems amazing. You're blind and you're not blind. I would think that's a good thing. And he said, did you ever have a patient with, you know, these two fingers numb? I said, sure. He said, what's the difference between these two fingers and these two eyes? It's all about, it's all about how the body functions. And as chiropractors, too many, um, <clears throat> too many of us don't have those opportunities to, 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 relate to that kind of chiropractor from the good old days, I would say, um, who has those experiences and those ways of teaching uh, this type of message because it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, a lot of people come in because, <clears throat> because they have their aches and pains and those things. There's nothing wrong with that. It's part of the human experience. It, it, what that nerve, you know, what they're perceiving is the sensory side. What they don't always know is the motor side. Um, you know, sometimes if it interferes with with something that they can be uh, that they can perceive as a problem, yeah, it's it's going to affect the the, uh, the they're going to be consciously aware of the pain because that's a conscious thing. But there's a lot of sensory things that we're not terribly aware of. There's a lot of motor things that we're completely not aware of. A lot of visceral function we're not aware of. So, you know, it's a much bigger it's a much bigger thing. And to and to make that shift, and I have to say, I don't see people that don't have a view of chiropractic, um, you know, in our country, uh, you know, we, our ratio of chiropractors is much different than yours. And I would say in my 30, 31 years now that, that um, the problem, the problem I see has changed. When I first got out of school in the late eighties, my biggest job was to explain to people what chiropractic is. And today my biggest job is to explain to people why they think what chiropractic is, isn't right. And so I have to wipe the board clean. And that is a big job because they, they have it so ingrained of some strange view of what we do. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, people putting, uh, you know, oil in people's navels and that's the whole chiropractic experience. I mean, there's no adjustment. There's no anything. We have chiropractors in, our, in my in immediate area that don't even adjust people. So when they come into my office, they don't understand uh, what I'm saying. And by the time that education process is even just beginning, they will make some comment about, well, why didn't the last place I go to do this? And, you know, I never down anyone like that. I think that's petty and childish. But, um, you know, I, I tell them, I can't be responsible for what happened to you in chiropractic before you came into my office, but I'm responsible for what happens in chiropractic in my office. And so, you know, I can't really comment on your previous experience, but I can tell you, this is what I do. And, you know, we, we just move forward because, you know, people already have, uh, you know, their opinions. And I think sometimes there's no need for us to, to, to tear someone down to, to build up chiropractic. I think that's, you know, being anti-medicine isn't chiropractic. That's not, that's not what chiropractic is. It's a completely different thing. Their model is the problem. It's not the, it's not the medical doctors. They get into school because they want to help people. They want to do good things. That no one gets in going, ah, well, you know, we're going to kill 186,000 people in the United States every year. I can't wait. No one does that. I mean, they're in a very, they're in a very dangerous model. And I'm not doubting them for that. It's a, it's a necessary model. If you have a part broken off, a hole where it shouldn't be, or any of those types of things, yeah, medicine makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, uh, the emergency rooms and those types of things. You know, if you if you uh, you know need those services, it's a fine thing. But if you're healthy, they really don't have much for you. And if you look at what they're doing now in our country with this um, current issue with the you know this respiratory virus, is they're putting more air into people with respirators. And I'm not knocking that. I'm glad they can do that. But if you think about what they're doing, they're just saying there's not enough air getting in, we'll push more air in. And that's their answer. And, and I'm not, that's not an abusive thing. I'm just saying they don't have um, an ability to raise the body's resistance because that's what has to happen. And everything from leprosy to cancer to epilepsy to anything, there are studies that show the, the, how, how people are adapting is predictive of their outcome. Uh, you know, even with cancer, it doesn't matter what stage a cancer is in, it matters how they're adapting. If they're adapting poorly in a, in a group, in a study, they've shown that uh, for almost every named cancer you could, you could think of, they've done studies with heart rate variability and shown that 
people with the poorest levels of heart rate variability in this group, they are the most likely to not survive. And the people with the best heart rate variability, no matter what stage their cancer is in, that they seem to survive at a much higher level. So they live longer as a whole, as a group. And, you know, so elevating that ability to adapt and, or removing an interference to the ability to adapt is a paramount message right now for our profession to uh, explain to people. You mentioned about heart rate variability. That's actually something I wanted to talk about a lot today. Can you tell people more about heart rate variability and some of the other penicillological tests that they can do to have this more objective view of what's happening with health? Well, you know, if you, if you look at three beats, you know, where we have, where you have that R peak that goes up and it's got the little peak. If you look at three of those, the space between these first two and the space between these second two is measured in milliseconds. So if they're identical, that's not necessarily a problem because it's two beats, but we have found um, in more cutting edge science today in major medical universities around the world that having um, two minutes of those beats. So if your heart rate is, you know, 60 beats a minute, so you take 120, uh, roughly 120 of those, of those spacings, and how much does it vary from this, this time to this time to this time? That's, you know, the heart rate variability. How much does it vary from this beat to the next beat to the next beat to the next beat? And the difference between success, those successive beats is heart rate variability. And because the body is always adapting, when you think of what B.J. Palmer was doing with his upper cervical graphs, where they would, they would, you know, run that that neurocalligraph up the cervical spine or the whole spine actually, and they would show a pattern, and that pattern would return, and that pattern would return, and they know that that person isn't adapting, um, you know, from that type of a test. The, the, um, you know, their view was when you're not when you're seeing a physiological um, um, repeatability or you see that same physiological thing is happening over and over and over and over and over with that, you know, with that graph, it's that same pattern. They have to interrupt that. They have to put a, a, a you know, that's where they would bring in a chiropractic adjustment to remove an interference. And heart rate variability is a way to measure before and after a change. What heart rate variability can't do is say, well, here's this. Here's a heart rate variability. Does this person need to be adjusted? It won't do that. That's not what it's for. It's basically to show a change in outcome from from what we do, or what anyone does, or what a medication does. They use it in research with um, Dr. Cohen, who's a medical researcher in Israel, has done a lot of work with um, antidepressants and PTSD, showing that people with diagnosed PTSD, you give them an antidepressant, and their heart rate variability changes. Um, so their answer, they're saying that, well, it's because their, their body doesn't make enough, uh, enough, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pro, uh, Prozac or whatever, you know, I mean, that doesn't even make sense, but medically they're, they're saying there's a problem with these people and they're not adapting properly. So we give them a medication, which changes the physiological function of their body, but it doesn't get to the reason because if you take it away, they go back. And 30 to 50% of people with, you know, uh, major depressive disorders are completely resistant to any medication uh, at all. Every, everything that's tried on them fails. Um, so, you know, there are other answers out there. And I'm not saying that, you know, we treat, you know, leprosy, cancer, or anything else. That's not what we do. You know, what we do is we look for an interference and, in, you know, that to that body's ability to adapt. And when we find that, that there's something interfering with that, we check for a subluxation. And if a subluxation is present, that's our avenue of approach, where a medical doctor says, well, we need to make a chemical change because they're not adapting properly. You know, they're, uh, you know, people have, um, you know, uh, hypotension where they'll stand up and they'll, they'll pass out because their, their heart function, their cardiac function doesn't change when they change postures you know, orthostatic hypotension. So they give them medications or do, do different things to try to change that. And, you know, from a chiropractic perspective, we would look to see if that person is subluxated like we would everyone else, even people with no symptoms. It doesn't really, we don't relate to that because we're looking at the level of health, not disease. Because as Didi said, disease is not an entity. It's not a thing. We can't measure disease. How much disease does this person have? We can't do that. It doesn't work like that. 
because what's happened is you lose health, which as Claude Bernard pointed out, makes you fertile soil to have problems. So, you know, I think that, you know, the, the message today is a little more difficult in our culture in America because everyone has opinions of what chiropractic is and they're quite often quite wrong. And uh, it's a little frustrating that, you know, after 125 years of, of uh, chiropractic that we're now at a point where we have to unteach people what chiropractic is because they've been told things that just are basically not true. Um, whether it's by a chiropractor or by someone else or by some, you know, there's so much information on the internet, you can find anything you want. You know, uh, some of the most crazy theories out there, they're all over the internet. And, uh, you know, they, they sound very convincing if you're, if you don't have a previous experience, but if someone has a chiropractic experience in your office or in someone watching this and they have an honest chiropractic experience, it's going to be more difficult for them to accept a crazy theory about chiropractic that, you know, someone says, you know, we, we eat babies or some crazy, you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm just saying some crazy far out thing about chiropractors. They're not going to buy into that, but that's our job to educate our community. So it's just a little more difficult, I think, than it used to be because we don't start with a clean slate in our country. You might be able to because you're a much, you know, a much different place than we are. We have, there are some issues and the way I describe it to my patients is that if somebody comes in, they say, oh, my last chiropractor did this. My argument would be, you know, my, my dentist can give me really good legal advice. But I'd rather speak with a lawyer. It's always good to have that kind of differentiation. You mentioned before about how chiropractic is being defined. Do you feel that the, in some ways the definition has shifted over time, either number one, because of chiropractors or number two, because of changes in the research, such as the improvements in HRV? I, I, can't, I can't say that I, I've seen that. I think if anything, it's more supportive of what chiropractic really is than where a lot of people would like to take it. You know, we see things from the WFC saying, you know, don't, don't talk about immune function in chiropractic. And, you know, if you look at what they wrote, what they're basically saying is we decided we're in charge of research and we decided not to do any. So sorry. I mean, that's what they're saying. And then they blame you for it, you know, as a, as a practitioner. It's your fault that we didn't do our job. That doesn't even make sense. It was really an admission of guilt from the WFC, you know, saying that, you know, we had an opportunity for the last 30, 40 years to do our job that we were getting paid to do. And we decided not to, uh, because all we've done is, you know, fifth lumbar studies all these years or whatever it might be. I don't, I'm not saying that's all they've done, but they they haven't done anything visceral. Uh, and that re that stopped in 1975 because there was an agreement made that Scott Haldeman led on that had all of our schools agree that we would stop teaching the visceral connection to the chiropractic adjustment. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been more difficult um, for students to be around the, the, um, the experiences that I was able to have in the 80s because a lot of those people just are gone. Uh, you know, that, that whole generation of, of people who, who practiced through the polio epidemic and uh, you know, who's, who's uh, there was a woman in the class ahead of me at Palmer who had polio as a child and she decided she was, she was well into her sixties as a student. And she had decided when she was a child because her family took her to a chiropractor and um, just out of desperation and didn't know where else to go because nothing was helping their daughter and she, her legs were paralyzed and she regained her function and decided when she was a child, she would be a chiropractor. And the way her path of life took her, she just had, you know, she got married, had children, but she knew someday she'd do it. And by the time she finally was able to get to get to chiropractic school, she was already in her 60s. But it meant so much to her because of her personal experience with chiropractic that she wanted to provide that, that um, opportunity that someone gave her to, to, to another child someday. And, uh, you know, that's a powerful motivator. And we don't have those today. You know, people get into our profession for completely different reasons. And there's some great chiropractors that get into this because it just was something they decided to do, maybe never having been to a chiropractor. But that doesn't mean they can't be a great chiropractor. We just have to put out the effort and keep working at it, you know, and, you know, do back to HRV just for a second. It's a fine thing, um, you know, to measure. But what it doesn't tell us um, is whether or not someone's functioning is becoming more chaotic where that heart rate is just all over the place or is it becoming more coordinated that it's doing that is it is it 
an increased coordination or are the wheels coming off? And it won't tell you that, but what does though are some new metrics. Um, we hired uh, three data scientists in, uh, in Europe to um, take some algorithms uh, I had and convert them into from some research that other people have done and convert them into data, uh, data code and build a website where any of us can upload um, an Excel spreadsheet file of, of the heart rate variability var uh, variables, you know, and upload that and it will tell you whether it's a, it gives you an entropy metric that is actually a good one. Most of them aren't very good for heart rate variability and there's two new ones and possibly three in the last just several years that have recently, very recently come up and uh, they're, they're showing extremely good results all the way down to 20 beats. Uh, 20 beats is coming out the same as 400 beats. We're coming out with the same entropy. So to me, that's valuable because if you can do a pre and post adjustment and show that someone's ability to coordinate the function of the, of the uh, uh, cardiovagal, you know, the, uh, the cardiac system has changed because of the adjustment. And we've been able to show this with people getting a sacrum adjustment and I mean, all kinds of things. So it's really, a, it's an exciting time for chiropractors and I don't think we all need to run out and get heart rate variability for our offices, but what we need to do is get our researchers to start using this, these tools and they're beginning to, um, I have, uh, I have, uh, uh, let's see, sorry. I have, uh, I don't know, 10 or 11, uh, electrocardiograph units that I lend out for research at no cost, um, because I want to see this work happen. And right now there's a study going on looking at, um, bedwetters. It's been going on for about a year now. And, uh, as data gets gathered, it gets sent to me. I clean the data. I don't even know if it's a pre a post. I don't know what it's for. I don't know anything about it, but I clean the data and I send it on to a, um, uh, a, a PhD researcher, a psycho, a psycho in uh, Europe who's heading the study. And then he tabulates the data and determines whether or not the results are positive, negative, or neutral. So I don't even know what's happening in the study because I, I have no idea just from cleaning the data, how, what the outcome is. So, um, we're, we separated the steps of it so no one can influence the outcome and, uh, it's the way research really should be done, but I'm hopeful from doing pilot work in my own office, and seeing the changes that I've seen with these kids, I totally believe we're going to see some uh, some good positive things. And that is something of value that you can use in your office and anyone here can use in their office to talk about what chiropractic has shown. You know, our personal office, I mean, you're welcome to, you know, use heart rate variability if you want, but it's not going to help you find a subluxation. It's not going to tell you if they're subluxated. And if their heart rate variability goes down, that's perfectly fine. Um, there are, there are incidences uh, like, uh, people with duodenal ulcers to have a, have a higher heart rate variability than people that don't have them. So it would make sense that if you adjust someone with a duodenal ulcer, that it may very well go down. Uh, we don't have that kind of research yet, but from a, from a, uh, formal logic perspective, uh, we can, we can see that assumption being made and it's something that research should be looking at and had the WFC taken up these important research questions, um, we would be in a much different place in our profession today. So hopefully, you know, with pressure from the, from the field, we can start getting the uh, results we want. But, you know, BJ used skin temperature and, you know, Uematsu and at uh, John Hopkins some years ago had done uh, temperature studies on the dermatomes, you know, where the, <clears throat> the spinal dermatomes, and they found that they should be side to side, left to right side within a very close range um, if there's normal function uh, of the spinal nerve roots. So, you know, this isn't just some harebrained thing that, you know, BJ Palmer just dreamt up in his sleep. It's, it's, it's got a lot of uh, scientific background to it. Uh, you know, much more than a questionnaire that just asks someone, does your low back hurt less after we just did this thing? Uh, you know, that's not really, that's not really objective research because a person can say, well, I don't want to disappoint him. So I say, I feel better. You, you don't know, you know, Heart rate variability removes that. Skin temp, you can't, you can't make your skin, your pattern happen. You can't consciously just make your pattern show up when someone graphs you. And it doesn't matter to me what people use. There are techniques that use, you know, leg length and, you know, a lot of different methods. And, you know, we don't have the, the plethora of, of research in any of those to a level that we should have because 
we've allowed the research community to set our agenda for our profession and they have been falling down on the job, quite honestly. Um, there are some very good people out there, don't get me wrong. I'm not condemning every researcher. Uh, I'm not condemning any of them, actually. I'm hoping that their own finding that they haven't been doing any immune work is a wake up call for them. Because you know we know that you know uh, interleukin one alpha, or excuse me, interleukin one beta, um, uh, tumor necrosis, uh, tumor necrosis factor, factor. factor, yeah, uh, uh, alpha and interleukin six are, are elevated in in a stress response, and if to, for to, to people when they become from from stress vulnerable, you know, like Claude Bernard talked about, to being stress resilient, those numbers shift. And so if we could show before and after chiropractic care, the chiropractic adjustment that we see shifts in those numbers, we may have something, but you know, it's a, it's a little ways down the road because there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to that point because we're starting from zero because nothing's been done. Um, you know, from the, from the larger picture, you know, you and I can't do the type of research that they, that they will, will look at because they want to do, um, uh, RCTs, you know, randomized controlled trials. So what do you do? You have kids come into your office that have I don't know, headaches, asthma, doesn't matter, epilepsy, doesn't matter. And you tell half of them, well, I'm going to randomly put you in a group and, you know, half of you aren't going to get any care at all, but I want you to keep coming in so we can measure things. They're not going to do that, you know. And so by them only saying they only want RCTs, that makes it so you can't have a voice in research. And that's the objective. They want the field out of their way because the field has a completely different experience with chiropractic than they want us to have. So it's being forced upon us. Um, and, and I'm hoping the profession is obviously starting to wake up and see that we need to have a, a voice in this. So, you know, any, any measure people, people use in their office can help determine if they're not adapting because the fourth component of that subluxation is a, is a, a diminished a quantity of mental impulse supply from a philosophical perspective. And the purpose of a mental impulse in our philosophy is to adapt that tissue cell for that moment in time. So it can't be delivered later. They're not backed up, you know, but behind a light switch with a big pile of electricity. So when you turn it on, all this voltage goes through. It doesn't work like that. So anything you use in your office that, that helps determine whether someone's adapting or not is perfectly acceptable, uh, you know, to, to measure a subluxation. And, you know, if we, if we can show before and after what we do as chiropractors, has changed that metric, whether it's a leg check or whatever it might be. Um, I'm not here to judge. That's not my that's not my perspective on what we do. Um, I just think that, you know, we need to have a bigger voice uh, if we're going to move this profession forward. And I don't think there's been a better time for us to move forward uh, than right now because we have, you know, along with the admission from the research community of failing us, um, we have you know, an interest in the profession and seeing this immune research done right now, because look what's going on around us. And if you and I had that, had that, you know, boil down to a simple message of what the research findings are that we could articulate easily and simply to our public, what a great, what a great uh, thing it would be for the, our community. You know, I know it's good for chiropractors, but I mean, I'm more worried about the people that we take care of than us personally. You know, my goal has you know, my office is my office. I do my thing and, you know, we do just fine, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's where the profession goes. That's always been a bigger interest to me because I want to leave it better than I found it. And, and I have to be honest in 30 years, I'm not seeing that, that massive sea change in the opposite direction uh, or in a positive direction. It's a little frustrating, you know, not getting any younger. What kind of changes would you say you have seen then over the past 30 years, whether it's in terms of philosophy or even in terms of the, what seems to be a plethora of new techniques that seems to be coming out? Well, you know, we can complain about the internet and a lot of those things and what information is out there. But to be honest, if you have an honest question of philosophy and are willing to do the work to determine if the answers you find on the internet are accurate or not, there's a lot of information available. I mean, those of us that were working on this, you know, my first 20 years of practice, um, the vast majority of what we learned was either in person with, with someone who knew more than we did that would, would help us and mentor us through that process, or it was reading uh, books and, you know, those types of things. And now, I mean, almost everything's available in a, in a different format. So it's a, it's a much easier process. Someone asked the question, 
a question yesterday, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Oh, is a um, it was um, our innate forces. <clears throat> excuse me, our innate force is always constructive, and of course, our 33 principles. You know, you know, towards the middle end of those, you, you'll see where it says innate fo uh, forces are constructive regarding structural, uh, you know, structural matter. Or, you know, our bodies, um, but. It's, and I said, yes, but it's a matter of perspective. And what I meant by that is that if you're a zebra, it's a destructive, it's, it's seen as a destructive thing when a lion attacks you. If you're the lion, it's seen as a constructive thing when the lion, you know, what's, you see what I mean? So it's a matter of perspective. If, if my innate intelligence, if you were in the way of my innate intelligence and it had the ability to take you out, it would do it in a heartbeat. So your body is innate matter. And, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. You know, the nutrition we take in has to, has to be mostly from innate matter of some kind, even fruits and vegetables and those kinds of things that they're living things at one point. So, you know, for that, for that vegetable or that fruit, it's a, it's a destructive force to be plucked from a tree and for me to eat that, digest it, break down its, its nutrients so that I can absorb those and make new tissue. Uh, but it's a, dis, you know, so it's a constructive thing from my perspective, a destructive thing from the tree. That, that's what I meant. It's a matter of perspective. Um, you know, those small little nuances of thinking are, are you know, are uh, uh, easier to find now because of the internet. And when I read that question and I thought about that, I thought, you know, we used to have to go through such hurdles to get this information and to process it and bring things together. I mean, it was a 20 year journey for me to get to write that first book on philosophy. And you know, the whole purpose of me writing that book was to, because I wanted to get down where I was at that point in 20 years so that someone else could say, here's some information. Cause I mean, it, it did take me, you know, two decades to, to put this together for myself. If I put this down in writing, maybe someone will pick this up and write the next great philosophy book by saying, this is all fine and good, but here's a new perspective on this philosophical point or this philosophical point. It's not the be all end all. There's no such thing. That's how philosophy works. It grows and develops. Um, very little has had a change in our philosophy over the years. And quite honestly, some of the things that people wanted to change, uh, we're now finding aren't, aren't so negative. I got an email from a, uh, a medical researcher in Australia uh, back in 2015. 14, I believe it was. It was 2012 or 2014. I'd have to go find it now. But he wrote me and he said, you know, I've, I found, I've, I've put a new word together to describe that departure from health. And he said, I've, I've decided to call it dis hyphen ease. What do you think of that? And I said, well, uh, you know, I, I'll have to think about it, but I'd go with it. And I wasn't going to lecture him on how that's a chiropractic term and this is what it means to us. It doesn't matter. What, what, what he's saying is, I'm seeing disease is not the entity, like Didi said. I'm seeing that health is the thing. When we depart from health, why are they departing from health? Why is this person sick? Well, he's trying to answer Didi's question. And it's medical researchers that are doing this thinking. So I welcome what they're doing. I think a lot of what's going on out there is very valuable. And a lot of philosophic thought is being confirmed not by our researchers, but by, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> medical researchers and people in other professions, psychophysiologists, and, you know, so much of this. And the reason I was drawn to heart rate variability is because uh, I was looking for a, a, a measure that could be objective, but scientifically accepted. Uh, heart rate variability, there's very few things that are measured in science that have more research behind them than heart rate variability at this point. And every year that, that expands rapidly. Um, there's so much, I mean, it's not even a question whether the heart rate variability can do what you and I would like to see it do. It does. There's, it's not even a question anymore. It does those things. Um, but, you know, that growth and change of our philosophy, um, a few things, you know, in, in my book, I, I put in the afferent side an afferent, what happens if there's an afferent interference? Because until 1998, science didn't think there was a, an afferent side of the vagus nerve, which brought information from the, all the organs and, and tissues that it supplies, which is a major part of the body. So in the 20s, when they said, when Stevenson wrote his book, 
his professors said, um, well, you know, we know the nerve impulse isn't all there is because uh, it just doesn't fit right now in the 1920s. So we're gonna use the term mental impulse because and we're gonna say it's abstract because until science answers that question of how we have the speed of communication in the nerve system and the function of the nerve system, uh, we can't say nerve impulse because that's obviously what they think the nerve impulse is scientifically and, and, and you know, it, or medically, whatever, however you wanna view it, we know that's not all there is. There's something more to it. And now we know there is. We know that there's an afferent side of the vagus nerve that's, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the function of the tissues of the vagus nerve are afferent, you know, going back uh, to, you know, innate intelligence draws that information up through the vagus nerve of the status of the body, makes, makes a determination of what the needs are and sends in for that mental impulse back to those tissue cells so specifically. And it's, one of the drawbacks I think we're going to find eventually of vagal nerve stimulators is because that all that does is it screams down the vagus nerve randomly. Those aren't coordinated actions that are being sent. So, you know, in a in a uh, in a, uh, a a bedwetter, it's going. I mean, does it increase the amount of bedwetting in people who use this? Does it increase the widening ulcers? Does it cause more people to be uh, have eating disorders because those things have more active vagal uh, nerve. So, you know, just screaming down the vagus nerve with a vagal nerve stimulator from a philosophical perspective alone, we don't have the research for this, but I have to question that. And our research gives us a really great compass. Our, our philosophy gives us a really great compass. And so the purpose of my book is so one day you pick up uh, some bits of information that you put together yourself and say, you know, this is all great and everything, but I think we need to make this change. And that's what I did with the afferent nerve. But I prefaced it by saying, if we find that how I phrase this is, isn't correct, it's on me. It's not the profession. It's, it's the author's fault. Because I had, I had to come up with a way of incorporating what science was finding in, in, you know, since 1998. So our philosophy does grow and change, but it's made to do that. Uh, not much has had to change in all 100 years or you know, a little more than 100 years. So it's, it's pretty solid. In terms of, I know you mentioned, of course, about the change you'd like to see in research. To actualize that, of course, we need to have probably have some change within the schools themselves. What changes do you think would be most beneficial? You know, it, it's tough um, because you know everyone likes to blame the schools because uh, it's easy. They're an easy target. You know, uh, it's it's a uh, you know it's um it's the it's the it's the easy weak link because all of us think we didn't learn enough. And I don't know how we think in three to five years, we're gonna learn everything we ever need to know about how we're gonna practice. Um, you know, so, but the schools, I, I don't know how it is in, in where you're at, but in America, you know, the, the Council on Chiropractic Education, the CCE says, this is what you have to teach. And then there's state boards uh, who, when I was a student, to, to get a license in Ohio, you had to know how to cast a fracture. Well, that's ridiculous. Nobody in Ohio is going to cast a fracture, but we had to have that training so that you could get a license in Ohio. In California, when I graduated, uh, what, I, what I understood is that you had to do a gynecological exam in front of the board live, and you had to find someone to use as a model for this demonstration. What, what are we doing? In, in Oregon, you had to be able to put two stitches in a cow's tongue on a dissection plate and that qualified you for minor surgery. Uh, so, you know, the, what the schools are, are, are being pulled and pushed to teach, I'm sympathetic to. Uh, I understand where they're at. They have to meet the guidelines that are set by the Council for Chiropractic Education in America or whatever, you know, whatever is in each country that oversees things. And they, those people have the control of our schools. And, and, and until and unless they start to look at um, what an actual science instead of following this dogmatic view that they've had since this since the dawn of time in our profession of, of uh, trying to drag us into medicine because uh, they want to be accepted and quite honestly um, medicine isn't going to accept this any more than they accepted osteopathy there's no difference between an osteopath in our country and a medical doctor uh, other than osteopaths aren't looked at by MDs as, as being fully respected because they should have been MDs instead of being osteopaths. And, you know, I think this, the change that needs to be in our schools, if I had a magic wand, and again, I'm not blaming the schools, but I think if we made things more clinically applicable, 
Um, you know, but while the CCE tells, tells our schools, we can't use anecdotal data. And to them, anecdotal data is Dr. Uh, Dr. Crowder telling me the, this, about this young girl who got her vision back because it wasn't published in a peer reviewed journal. He couldn't talk about that in the classroom today. And you know, that's, it's, it's kind of tied the hands of our, our schools and their, their faculty. They're a great faculty in a lot of schools, um, you know, and none of them can teach the level of chiropractic that even I learned in the eighties now, because they're, they're hamstrung. And until the control of our schools um, reflects what you and I see in practice every day, it reflects what chiropractic is. And what chiropractic is, is what you and I see every day. It's what the patients in our office experience uh, as a change. This has to be part of the chiropractic picture. And until and unless, uh, you know, unless and until that changes, the schools can't change much. But I think that um, I would like to see the schools be a little more, um, a little more stickler, a little more picky about how the students practice in the student clinic. Because someone can go to some weekend seminar that some, you know, wild-eyed chiropractor came to their town and decided to put on a seminar and he tells everyone, oh, don't learn what they teach you in school, it's all wrong. What you need to learn is what I do. And it's some cockamamie thing about, you know, looking at their irises to determine their health or, you know, whatever, the iridology or, you know, uh, there's all kinds of things out there, you know, how to do muscle testing for nutrition and, you know, things that have failed that test of science. And students uh, become, I think today are, are um, they're, they're, they're taught that they're critical thinkers. Um, but to be honest, I think most of them are just critics because to be a critical thinker, you have to think. And to challenge everything that comes out of someone's mouth because you think that makes you a critical thinker, it doesn't. Uh, you know, Stevenson's textbook, you know, he says that until you reach a certain chapter of his book, you shouldn't question our philosophy. Just accept it for now until you get enough pieces to put that picture together. If you're not willing to take that first piece of a puzzle and, and, and say, well, how do I know this is going to fit something I'm going to need later? And you tell them, well, it is. Just hold that thought and we'll, it'll make sense. And they won't let you move forward because it's challenge, challenge, challenge. And what they really need to do is stop, absorb, go home, think it through, put the pieces together, come back to class and look for those small bits and pieces because one day a lot of this stuff comes together and makes sense. And that's what makes us chiropractors is the way we, can, we put that information together to form a cohesive way of viewing that person, that lens we see someone through, it colors our thinking. It, it makes that, that patient, that prospective patient or whatever it might be, it's sitting in front of us. How do we approach them? What are we going to measure? How are we gonna determine there's a subluxation? Uh, you know, if, if they have a subluxation at, you know, the Atlas, the T5 and, you know, L4, how do I approach this? What, what should be my process? You know, how do I determine what I need to do today? Uh, you know, uh, are they adapting or is it, are they not adapting? Well, however it might be, we need to have the pieces to put that together. And until you're at the point where you can think clinically, which you can't when you first come to chiropractic school, it's not a dig. None of us could. We couldn't. Um, but try to just listen more and absorb more so you can put those pieces together. I know there are some schools out there that make it a little tough, but uh, you know, <clears throat> I don't think anyone is, any school is terrible. Um, I think there are schools that are more difficult for students to, to get the pieces they need. Uh, you know, I'm not going to name names because there's no, there's no profit or point to that. Um, but I think that great students and great chiropractors have come out of almost every school I could probably think of. And there are quite a few. Um, you know, we had great chiropractors or great students that are, you know, are a great faculty, excuse me, at say Palmer years ago when Galen Price taught philosophy from the 19, from 1936 when Stevenson was hit by a streetcar and died all the way up until he, re he retired in the 1980s, early mid 1980s, <clears throat> they had the opportunity to learn from one of the greatest philosophical minds our profession has ever had, but they didn't practice that way. They ignored it when they went out. And there are, there are lousy chiropractors that had the opportunity to sit at that brilliant man's feet and ignored him. But there are great chiropractors that went, at school, went to schools where they learned no philosophy whatsoever, but they sought it out and they built themselves a, a beautiful mosaic of what chiropractic is. And they're great spokespeople for our profession. So 
you know, I don't condemn any individual school or anything like that, but if we're not open to just absorbing a piece of information and giving it time to process and put together, I don't see how this profession's ever going to, to move forward and grow. Um, that to me is the biggest challenge today. I've been asked to be faculty at five different chiropractic schools and I've turned every one of them down. And to be honest, mostly it's because I don't have time in my life to challenge when I introduce myself, do you have a, do you have a birth certificate? I don't believe you. I don't have time for this. You know what I mean? I, I want to just move forward and, and grow this profession. And I don't have time to, you know, the, the old analogy of the hotel's on fire and you knock on a door because, you know, you, 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 smell, you wake up in the night and smell smoke. You open the door, the hallway's full of smoke. You go to the first door next to you and you knock on the door and say, the hotel's on fire, hurry up and get out. And the people open the door, thank you so much. And they gather their things and run out the door and everybody's knocking on doors and getting people to leave. When you knock on a door and they say, prove it. How long are you gonna sit there and argue with that person before you just go to the next door? And, and that's, I think the problem is that there's too many people today in our profession who say, prove it. And I, I don't have that time in my life to, to argue minutia that, that, you know, some tiny philosophical point that had to be built on larger philosophical points. Do you, you see what I mean? And, you know, that's my only criticism of, of where we're at with our schools is we have to be more open-minded and listen and put the pieces together and use a, you know, build a chiropractic compass. And on my, both of my books buried in the cover is a, is a, a compass rose, you know, the north, south, east, west. And that's very meaningful to me because I see our philosophy as a compass. It guides every decision I make in my practice. You know, is this person adapting? Well, that's a philosophical premise. When someone comes into my office, let's see how you're adapting today. Well, they have no idea. So they're ready and open and willing to hear me discuss what that means to them today on this visit compared to the last time they were in, what changes we're seeing. But we can go a whole new direction and, uh, you know, that open-mindedness is so important. Uh, but, you know, accepting things whole cloth forever isn't a good idea either. There has to be a mixture. But sometimes we just have to accept some things. I had a, a faculty member contact me yesterday about a, uh, a case study that a, one of my old professors uh, in diagnosis department had written at Palmer about one of my cases, oh my, 20 years ago. And she was using it in her class and a student was challenging that, uh, you know, how did I know this happened or whatever it was? And it's just crazy to me. Uh, and I told her after our discussion, I said, I don't know how you do it every day. I don't know how you can walk in a room and just have to argue everything all day long. It's so, it's so draining on a teacher that's trying to help and, and for people because they have this dogmatic view of what they want the answer to be and they may not like it to, to have to have their way. Um, and I don't know what that is or what it's caused from, but as a profession, until we change that, we're in trouble. You know, we, we have to be open and accepting to it. I hear things all the time that I don't necessarily agree with from a philosophical perspective, but I'm willing to sit back and, and listen to that and, you know, and have a discussion about it instead of this prove it nonsense. You know, I mean, uh, it doesn't work that way. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay it's actually it's interesting something you said in the middle made me think so i went to a i'm from england so i went to aecc sure. and it's very much a medical based institution but again some of the most philosophically minded chiropractors that i'm still in touch with are people from that school even though i'm one of the few people like that in singapore itself even one of my colleagues here is very philosophically minded i think in some ways almost like a rebellion it's almost that you're taught this for such a long time then you question it then you go no this can't be right but we weren't introduced to any green books, any books by Strauss, anything at all. So we have kind of had that disadvantage to an extent. For those students coming out of, say, those institutions or even ones that are more philosophically sound, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you want them to take forward? Would you think it'd be good for them to say into a mentorship program? Would it be good that they uh, maybe open their own practice straight away? What would be a good next logical step for them? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, given the internet, I mean, you know, granted, I've been doing this for a long time and this Zoom thing's fairly new to me, but I've probably done a dozen of these in the past, <laughs> past few weeks and I, they're quite enjoyable, I have to say. But these types of things have a value um, where you have the opportunity to, as a student, to contact people across the world who might be able to answer a question you have or, or um, 
discuss a view you have or whether or not it's it's a congruent view with chiropractic or whatever it might be you know something that's going to help you grow you well, we didn't have that ability we got to listen to whoever they put in front of us or whoever came to town and that was it uh, you know very few of us would write letters to people in the field to ask questions uh, I used to do a series I, I call letters home and I would write to some of the great old chiropractors you know Galen Price was one and, and it was just a, a, a litany of great old chiropractors that were around the country who uh, were very famous and I was shocked how many of them would write back with their views on something to help me grow. Um, but you can do that in 10 minutes now where before it would take five weeks to get an answer back if you were going to get one at all. Um, and you know, AECC, um, you, you may know what you weren't learning. Um, when I went through Palmer in the eighties, we were taught, we were taught philosophy and those things, uh, as you would expect, but it wasn't widely discussed among the students. Maybe it was for the reason that we kind of just, it made sense to us. But when you're, when you get something as a student, you don't see the big value in it. When you have to claw and fight to find it. Um, if you tell students, we're not going to teach you philosophy, every student in that class just heard you say, you better get out of, you better get outside of the classroom to find philosophy because for some reason they don't want me to know some things and I don't think that makes any sense because if we don't teach people philosophy or the parts of our profession the entire thing uh, philosophy the art the, you know the how, how to apply that philosophy and how to apply that science and the science itself if we don't cover that entire thing we're editing their education we're, we're handicapping them um, because we want them to to reflect our image or where we want the profession to be. And if we give them more information, they may make a decision uh, about seeing someone that we don't like. Um, you know, I, I have seen uh, people with, I, I'm sure a lot of things that would uh, frighten, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, just to approach, just to have someone come in with, you know, some certain medical diagnosis or, or whatever it might be. Um, but my job is to see if they have a subluxation to remove that interference and let the body do what it does. I, the, every single person before I adjust them, I tell them when you're, when you see a, when you, uh, you know, when you see a change in your body or whatever you come in for that you think is, is the reason you're here. When you see that change that you're looking for, don't blame me. My job is to remove the interference. My job is to, you know, go down into your basement, do an analysis of those switches in the in the fuse panel, and say, "Boy, this one's not right," and set that switch specifically in a certain direction to make to a to a certain end. And then I go upstairs, and you thank me for fixing your refrigerator. Well, I don't know anything about refrigerators. I didn't fix your refrigerator. But then everybody you know with a refrigerator problem, you send to me. Man, this guy knows everything about refrigerators. He fixed mine. I didn't fix your refrigerator. You see what I mean? So. But our culture in America, especially, is so something has to be done to us to make us healthy. You know, health comes in this potion or in this bottle of pills or whatever it might be. Uh, so when someone comes in and they'll say after a few visits, you know, whatever their whatever issue that they're noticing, you know, uh, boy, I'm really noticing this or that positive change in their physiology. I'll say, well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Now, did you finish that whole bottle of those uh, pills that Gail gave you at the front desk? Well, she didn't give me any pill. I said, she didn't. Huh. I said, so I didn't put anything into you, right? What? No, no. What are you talking about? I said, okay, so I didn't put anything into you to make this change that you're seeing is so positive. And I didn't, I don't remember taking a scalpel and opening you up and moving your organs around or changing something in you anatomically from in that perspective. Um, what did I do? What did I do to make this change? What do you think it was? And I have them explain it to me. Because it's important for people to start to realize health isn't something that they give you. It's something that you possess that is, that is, with, that is drawn away from. You know, there's a, there's a steps away from health. And removing an interference to the normal processes of the body, you know, that's what every doctor does. Every single type of doctor, our way of approaching it is the vertebral subluxation. So, you know, we just do our job and the body does really cool things and we get credit, which is just a... It's amazing to me, um, but you know, I think that students 
if, if they're in a place where they don't feel comfortable with, with having their education edited for them, where they're told what, what they're able to learn, it's like if you're being taught half the alphabet, but you find out there's more letters and they say, ignore those. Don't, we're not learning vowels here. We don't teach vowels. That's nonsense. That's, that's dogmatic. We refuse to teach vowels. And you go, well, I don't know. It just kind of, why don't we learn all the letters? It doesn't make any sense. Those students, what they need to do is, is on their own, seek out information. You should do this whether you're at a school that you think is teaching you everything you need to know or not. No matter what your perspective is, seek out information be accepting of the idea that what you think might not be 100% accurate. Because if we, if we think that we're there, that we've, we've got everything we're ever going to need to know about chiropractic and, and our, our philosophy and how it works and the theory behind it, you're not practicing. You're done. I mean, you, you're not practicing. Practicing to me is that you, you practice to become better. And as long as we open our minds and are willing to grow, and that's what I would encourage a student to do. I don't care if they go to school. I don't care if they go to the greatest chiropractic school that's ever been known that teaches them everything that could they possibly learn about chiropractic. Keep your eyes open and look for opportunities to, to see a bigger picture of it, but measure it against the, the, the philosophy, that compass, to see if it's going to take you in the direction of what chiropractic is about, or if it's going to take you in the opposite direction. And, by treating people and using, you know, that kind of terminology, you're saying you're doing something, you're putting something into them that makes the change that you made their physiological change and you don't, you know, that's, that, that's, it's not our job. Our job is to remove the interference. And, you know, if students can just consider that, that may be right and seek information to that. And sometimes what you need to do is to seek out what, the people who have the strongest voices that are in opposition to where you currently are, seek out what they have to say and go through what they have to say and the argument they make for why they think that and look at it objectively and try to think, how would you debate this without calling them names or any of that rhetorical nonsense that people love to do? Don't do Facebook stuff. You know, don't, don't, don't attack people. That's such garbage. What we need to do is, is, be objective and look at the way they make their argument and find if there is a flaw in that argument or if they have something of value. And if they have something of value, put that in a, in a special place in your mind and hold on to that and remember that because at some point you'll be able to, to bring that piece in and you'll see a bigger part of the puzzle. So, you know, that would be my best advice. As well as the advice, of course, for students, especially now that people are, especially say here there's definitely a lot more what we call like working from home but really it's people in a lockdown what kind of advice would you have then for the patients who i mean they really should be in control of their own health anyway but what kind of advice would you give for them now for the patients that can't come see you you mean or um for patients and for people in general to be honest people that are stuck inside not getting out well you know think of why you're there and you know what i've noticed in in my own town we have a uh, a bike trail or a walking trail that's, I mean, the whole thing end to end is probably 30 to 50 miles long. It's quite large and it's paved black topped. It's, you know, quite wide. It's very nice. And I have seen people on that thing when I drive by, it used to be, you'd see young people like yourself that are, you know, dressed in track, you know, in, in running clothes. I mean, they're where they have the whole garb and everything they're wearing uh, says that they do this a lot that they're, this isn't something new that they're doing. And what I've noticed is that I'm seeing more and more people that look like they've never gone for a, a long walk before, let alone a jog, because they're scared. They're looking at this and what's going on. They're watching the news and they're seeing the, you know, reading the newspapers and seeing information of what's going on. Maybe they have friends or relatives that have, you know, succumbed to this, uh, you know, this uh, current issue we have going on internationally. And they're thinking, I have to make myself stronger. Yes, most of the people who've, who've died from this have um, secondary issues. You know, they're, they're overweight. They have high blood pressure. They have whatever it might be. They have some other diagnosis. Yeah, that's true. But in the public in general, that's true. Most of the people have some diagnosis of some kind, and they're scared right now. Um, I would suggest that people who are, who are at home right now start to think of ways that they can um, it, regain some of their level of health. 
yeah, getting out and walking and doing some things that people are starting to do, eating healthier. Yes, that all makes sense. But you, you, um, there's nothing that I can do in my office. And where I'm at in Illinois, I'm south of Chicago, we can do anything at all except drugs and surgery as chiropractors here in Illinois. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I can do, but I do nothing but chiropractic in my office. I don't give, you know, I don't sell nutrients. I don't do any of these things. I'm not saying nutrition, there isn't a value or whatever it might be. That's not my point. My point is the time I spend in my office is constantly with people. How do I best, um, how do I best, give them information or give them something of value to get them from that level of health to a different level of health. Handing them, you know, um, organic food isn't going to get them from this level of health to this level of health, or, or it's not going to get, you know, to have them come into my office and run on a treadmill isn't going to get them from this level of health to this level of health today. What's going to get them from this level of health to a higher level of health today is removal of the subluxation, that interference to that, that supply. I can show you lots and lots and lots of cases of, of before and after adjustments, the changes we see in very objective measures, um, heart rate variability, uh, pupillary light reflex. Pupillary light reflex is a handy thing. Now there are apps that are starting to come out that kind of do some of these things. Uh, the studies haven't really dug into them deep enough for me yet uh, to say to go to that route. The one I use is, is extremely expensive. It's $5,000 and I would never suggest anybody buy one. I don't charge for it when I use it in my office. I don't charge for heart rate variability. I don't do any of those, those things. My, my practice is about checking for a subluxation, removing the interference, and that's what people come in, in, in uh, for. And that change that they get post-adjustment, I have never seen a study that elevates that level of heart rate variability or that I've never seen a study showing uh, that diet can make a big change in pupillary light reflex you know today by eating an organic carrot your your pupillary light reflex doesn't rapidly change but I have seen drastic and massive change in those measures those objective measures that the patient can't control and I can't control it's objective it's not a survey to say how, how do you feel do you think you blink faster now you know your your, your uh, pupillary light reflex is faster now it doesn't it's not a survey these are objective no one can influence them it's science and i can show massive changes before and after an adjustment now those other things have value to tell people you know while you're doing this you probably see value in doing other things that'll help along the way what can i do at home well you know you can try eating a little bit better. We can all eat better. I eat stuff I shouldn't eat all the time. So what? We all do. Everybody that pretends they have this pure diet, it's, it's, it's fancy. It's ridiculous because our, you can't breathe clean air. Not in our country. You can't breathe clean air, drink clean water, eat clean food. Everything we have is polluted. They inject the animals with things that, you, that meat you eat. They, they spray our fields with pesticides that our water is, is tainted with every drug imaginable that people when they urinate in the toilet, the drugs go right into the toilet and back to the processing plant and it's recirculated back to us. And they have shown around the world, every stream that in our, in our, in our country, especially that they have caught a fish in, they find medications in the, in the flesh of the fish. You can't avoid these things. So to say, you know, I eat a pure diet, you don't, but you do the best you can. That's all any of us can do. I'll agree with that. Um, and you know, encouraging people to do those things is great. Uh, but nothing is going to make that change. And it, to me, if you if you focus on uh, you know selling bottles of nutrients to people in these things, and you also adjust them, and you're a great chiropractor, and you give a fantastic adjustment, you give a great chiropractic service. How do people know what made the change? Is it the adjustment, or was it that bottle of stuff you gave me? Am I going to tell people, boy, you should get some of these? Oh, I found them on Amazon. I don't even have to go to the chiropractor anymore. I can order them online. This is great. They're cheaper through Amazon too. So, so what are you giving people? You know, we have to focus on that. If you want to talk nutrition in your office, it's up to you. I don't. I, I tell people, you know, that want to know minutia about nutrition. I send them to a to a nutritionist or there's a local um, health food store where the people are extremely knowledgeable, uh, and I don't have a problem with that. You know, let them go that route. They're they're heading towards health. That's fine. Uh, but you know, there are people who. Uh, in Dr. Barge's book, I believe it was Giant versus Pygmy and Thoughts, where he uh, went through that book of BJ's and kind of wrote his views of it. 
I think it's in that book. There's a story of Uncle Dickie, a man who lived to 105 and had the worst diet imaginable, smoked cig cigar uh, cigars and just, he did every, violated every rule of health and he lived to 105. So, you know, who's to say, you know, how, how big those things are going to be. Now, what we don't know is whether he was subluxated or not, you know, and I think that would have had, uh, you know, interference in the nerve system scientifically has been shown to be a bigger culprit for, um, for the body's the body's trajectory of life, where you're going to end, than than anything. I mean, heart rate variability uh, is seen as uh, an effective measure in some countries. I know in South Korea they they're starting to use heart rate variability to determine who needs, uh, um, what do you call that, um, hospice care at the end of life, because the I guess the South Korean doctors weren't too keen on telling people we only have two months to live. So they'd say, well, you know, you got about a year because they don't like to give people bad news any more than I would. I understand that. But you can't get into hospice in South Korea until you're at a certain a certain span of life left. So people were dying at home before they ever got into hospice, miserable deaths, because there was no one there to help take care of them. So um, they started to do studies of heart rate variability. And what they found is that they could determine by heart rate variability who might need hospice care. And they, they also found that it was kind of predictive of who was going to die this month of people in hospice care. Uh, you know, so it's a, it's a predictor of, of uh, you know, Ohio State University has shown that it's a predictor of future cardiac um, mortality problems, you know, that you, you may die of a heart problem. You know, decades earlier, when you see heart rate variability shifting that way, it's predictive of, of problems. It's predictive of an earlier death, of what they call all-cause mortality, anything people die from. They're able to, sh to show that when you stop adapting the way you're supposed to, that you're speeding that trajectory of your life, you're shortening it. And if we have any role as chiropractors, we remove an interference to where that trajectory might have landed. Your grandparents have a role in how far that trajectory might be. I get that. I'm not arguing DNA isn't a, isn't a thing. I'm not arguing that, you know, the, the, you know, falling off of a roof or jumping headfirst into an empty pool might shorten your lifespan because of the traumas and tribulations we all go through. But, you know, there's nothing I can do in my office that's going to make as quick and dramatic a change as looking for a verbal subluxation and, and, and offering a chiropractic adjustment. Um, you know, I'm not treating their lack of adaptability. I, I am removing interference to that, to that ability to adapt. That's all I do. I agree. I mean, I think it's, yeah, we can do only certain things in our office. I mean, we literally, I think for maybe a few months, we had kombucha and to be honest, we didn't really sell much, but I drank most of it myself. It's nice to just go in and just <laughs> go in and do chiropractic for people as much as they can. And especially like you said, it's doing the best they can right now. Especially when when I, I bought a bottle of that. It was at a gas station. I was going on a trip. Actually, I was going to Ohio State for, for, to, for some research training uh, a few sum, two summers ago. And I saw this kombucha. And I heard people mention it. I didn't know what it was. So I bought a bottle of it. I couldn't, I couldn't drink it. I bought the wrong flavor, maybe. I don't know. But, oh, man, it didn't. I mean, you know, it, whew, it was tough stuff for me. But, uh, you know, yeah, those things are important. And I, I'm, I'm, please don't misunderstand that I'm not saying those things don't have a value. But to make the most, the most important change, and I don't want people confused about what made the difference for them, their body did that. Removing an interference allowed their body to do great things. And, you know, um, I had a, early in my career, I was just in practice less than a year, I had a woman come in, and I was using a scope, and I was scoping her spine, I was marking, you know, temperature breaks. And uh, one day she brought in, and she was an older woman, and she brought in her daughter, who was maybe 30 years old. And I was not quite 30 myself at the time. I was young like yourself, and I was once. And, and uh, her daughter's leaning over watching me, you know, as I'm scoping and marking her back. And I said, uh, well, here's why I'm doing this and what I'm looking for. And okay. And she said, now, now where do you get that that pencil you're using. I said, well, it's just a wax pencil or, or a wax, you know, artist pencil. You can, you can get them at an art store or a, or a teaching store. They use them to mark glassware, you know. Um, I might have an extra one if you need one. You know, if I can look around, I'll, if I have an extra one, I'll give it to you. And she goes, well, yeah. well, I should tell you, my mom has been doing so much better since you've been marking her back with that pencil. 
See, so we weren't always great educators. And that's when I realized I have to start doing a better job at educating people because the mother didn't even realize that the adjustment I gave her made a change, you know, made a change in her system. It wasn't marking her back with a wax pencil. And, you know, if I also gave her a bottle of vitamins or, you know, I'm not picking on nutrition. It doesn't matter. Or an exercise program. I need you to do, you know, this many stretches this way, this many stretches that way. And they go home after the first visit and start doing these things. They come back the next visit. I'm doing a lot better. Those stretches are great. You know, I mean, <laughs> if you're going to give them stretches, send it to them before they come in so they can start. And they're going to say that didn't help me at all. Um, I get the reason for those things, but causing confusion in, the, in our patients is dangerous because they're not going to understand where the credit lies and the credit lies in them that their body's ability to, to function the way it's supposed to. So I'm sorry for being kind of long-winded on some of these. Okay. <laughs> I just want to thank you for joining me today. I want to thank everyone who's watching this either live or is watching again on the replay. If you have any questions, of course, you can put them all into the comments as well. Uh, thank you so much Great. for joining me today. Uh, it was absolutely my pr pleasure. I wish you all the best in uh, your burgeoning uh, chiropractic country over there. And, you know, the ratio you have, you have a lot of work to do. I'm surprised you can have time to get on, to get away from your adjusting, t <laughs> adjusting table with millions of people, you know, that are you're responsible to you. But, you know, you have an opportunity to teach a country what chiropractic is that may have no idea. And what a great thing that beautiful, clean chalkboard is to go up and write the correct answers on. And you don't have to sit there with a scrub brush and try to scrub nonsense off of it for graffiti that has been painted on their brains. You know, uh, it's, I'm, I, I long for those days when I was young like yourself and that was kind of the way it was. So thank you.